but it's humans. <laughs> that, that's a nice way to start it. Okay, so we have Haley here today. I'm, I'm super happy she's joining us. Um, she was a part of a lot of very cool, interesting projects. Um, she's going to tell us more about, about the story, but like TLDR is she was a part of Bloom project. That's how she got introduced to the whole LLM space. And then she was a big part of, I, I think, one of the leads. You can tell us more about on the Pythia project. Um, and finally, uh, she's also like one of the core, if not the core, contributor to the LM Harness eval, which is super impactful project that I'm actually currently dealing with. So I'm, I've been pinging Haley a bit uh, in the background. So like super appreciate the the, the, the help. Um, so with that, I think you can you can kick it off. Um, and yeah, thanks for, for coming. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Alexa. And uh, yeah, I think you mentioned like uh, if at any point people have questions, feel free to. Or Alexa, feel free to interrupt me if there's like a hand raised or something. And, awesome. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll just be basically if somebody wants to ask a question, just raise a hand, and I'm gonna be curating um, and in interrupting Haley unless you hear like a notification sound when somebody raises a hand. Can you maybe confirm if I do this? Do you hear it? I do. Yeah. Okay. Then we can maybe that can be a signal uh, for, for you as well. Awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah. So yeah, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, yeah my background and then also some of the projects I've worked on and sort of some of the uniting themes between them. Um, yeah, so just uh, like in general, before we get started, like just a bit about my background and how I got involved in like language models and Duluth AI. I had some sort of prior um, NLP experience um, as a research assistant in a uh, lab where I did my undergrad, but didn't really um, have that much contact with like um, how to train language models or the engineering involved there or sort of what the, the state of the field was there. But um, I really started uh, taking notice of the field and getting uh, experience in it when I started uh, trying to get involved at Big Science, which if people aren't familiar, it was a very big, um, like a thousand plus person multi-stakeholder effort to build a, a Bloom uh, 176 billion parameter multilingual model um, on a French supercomputer that they got a grant on. Um, and so this is sort of a, a project that ran from, I think, like fall 2021 until um, late 2022, where basically anyone could just join. And then if you had the relevant sort of uh, background knowledge or were able to contribute, um, uh, you could get involved in the various sort of sub projects of this big effort. And so when I joined, uh, the training of this large model had started and I didn't have any experience with training these models but I did have some uh, opportunities to sort of observe what people cared about or what people were sort of like looking forward uh, toward in terms of the state of the LLM field and like what things uh, needed to have progress made on them. And also got the opportunity to collaborate with some uh, very cool um, collaborators who I wouldn't have otherwise met as well as worked on some sort of sub projects that started later on, including some uh, like a, this project Bloom plus one, which was about um, adding languages to the Bloom language model after training and also a um, multilingual uh, instruction tuning with MT0 and a bit of the uh, evaluation efforts um, that Big Science was sort of running as part of one of its subgroups. Uh, and then from there, I um, sort of ended up uh, meeting some of the people involved in Eleuther AI, including uh, Stella and Lintong. Uh, Lintong is one of the uh, other uh, uh, d developers on the LM evaluation harness with me. Um, uh, and started hanging around the Eleuther AI Discord server at the time. This is like a, a late summer 2022 and sort of was in the right place at the right time and ended up having the opportunity to collaborate with them on some research projects and uh, ended up working part-time at Eleuther as it was sort of forming into a full formal nonprofit. Um, and now uh, we're at the point where I'm a full-time uh, research scientist now that I graduated and we have sort of a, sm a small staff of people trying to uh, coordinate research projects and help the open source uh, research community. Uh, yeah. That's, that's amazing. Maybe a quick question on the Luther AI because you're a nonprofit. How does that, I, I guess you do have like full time, you, you, you have like normal, normal salaries and everything from the donations or however the, the organization is structured. I, I, I don't get that part of the Luther AI, honestly. I know the stability AI is kind of also funding some parts, computer, whatnot. If you can maybe, yeah, tell something about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So Luther, we have, yeah, we're a nonprofit and we have sort of a small staff of about like 15 people um, who are working on research full or part time. Uh, and uh, we have funding from a couple different uh, like companies, including Stability and Hugging Face um, and Canva. 
um, to sort of uh, supply salaries and uh, yeah, keep research running. And then we also collaborate with like other academics and other volunteer contributors to try and sort of do this research. And we also have some like compute uh, such as the cluster time granted by Stability AI. So that's how we're able to like train language models. Awesome. Awesome. And maybe maybe like uh, for people who are interested in joining Galuther AI, what's the best way to 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 join and become one of the of the core staff? Like is it basically come to our Discord and then like contribute and, and that's how you pick your your collaborators or like what's the process? Yeah, so the best way is just to like first uh, just come by the Discord and like say hi and then sort of uh, hang around and sort of understand how get a feel for how things operate and sort of like see what like you can contribute or pick up in discussions. And then we have sort of various ongoing projects which we try to sort of run in the open and uh, like have discussions so that people can follow along and then try to engage volunteers as well. Um, and then we also have sort of places where people can, if you've got say like an idea that you want to try and scale up um, and you've done some experience with, we have like a community projects uh, channel where anyone can sort of pitch a project and you know, if, if we have the compute available, then we try to support those and try and like help people, including trying to help people who don't have like academic experience, but have like done some very cool work with LLMs, trying to help them like publish in more traditional ways. That, that's awesome. Cool. And uh, may, maybe like just going all the way back before 2022 when you joined Bloom, like what's the, how did you enter into machine learning? What's your first exposure to ML? What was it literally like around, no, you actually said you had some pre NLP experience back at, at the, as a research assistant. So if you can maybe just briefly describe that part of the journey. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So like I sort of had some interest in NLP because I was originally interested in linguistics uh, very early on, um, very interested in like other languages and how they're formed and work um, and like uh, trying to understand them. And uh, yeah, so NLP was very interesting to me in that way. So I, I got to meet some sort of like academics working on it and sort of learned a bit about the problems they cared about, like, um, you know, question answering or just like natural language understanding um, and generation. And yeah, yeah, picked some of that up, but then was not was sort of vaguely aware of like things like GPT-3 going on, but didn't really know the full story until I uh, engaged more with the community and learned more right. about the literature. So 2021 is when you really start like, like no nose down or what's what's the expression of just like doing ML full time, much more engaged or is that the correct way to phrase it? If I understood you correctly, uh, I suppose so. Yeah, I would say I was I was very much not full time in twenty twenty one. I was a student and sort of fairly new to CS and ML. So I think yeah, I don't know. I have a fairly atypical journey to where I am, and also I think I am fairly sort of like junior in my experience still. Um, that's great. I, that makes two of us, I guess. I also had fairly, fairly <laughs> non-traditional experience with like, I, I didn't have any official ML courses as well. And so I, I think that's great and also encouraging for people. Like it's it's completely possible. Like I've seen, especially over the last year, I've seen so many people who came into the field and immediately kind of um, make their way to the, well, quote unquote top, like in the sense of being in, in the Twitter space. Uh, like, uh, and, and a lot of them were just helping around um, instruction, um, like tuning data sets and stuff like that. Like even without any knowledge of, of mathematics or programming, you can still contribute. And, and I think that's kind of like a cool, encouraging thought, I guess, for people who are just starting in the space. Yeah, definitely. I think it's interesting that like, yeah, you know, the, the field of language models is still fairly early and to the point that you, you sort of can learn everything there is to know, or at least at a high level, just be like aware of the state of the fields. Although there are also like downsides at times because there's plenty of like reinventing the wheel that happens. But yeah, it's great that sort of it's easy to get yourself up to speed and contribute. 100%. 100%. And maybe one more question I'm curious personally about like when you were on the Bloom project, because obviously there, I, I know there was a ton of people. I remember the reading the paper and like the, the list was crazy and just the big science project in general. And obviously you had a limited amount of compute. I don't remember like was it maybe 1 million hours or something, but like still it's limited a lot of people. Did you get to like kick off runs back then, or or you were, what what did you actually help around when you were de dealing with the Bloom project? I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. Yeah. So well, first of all, so the Bloom project was a grant on the Jean Zay, a French government supercomputer. 
So it was limited to only, uh, I think, uh, EU citizens who could actually sort of have the necessary background checks and yeah, get approved to run things. Um, but other people could help in various ways, like doing like things with like, the code bases used and um, like research work. Um, so I wasn't involved in the like main bloom training at all. I was just involved in sort of other projects that were organized out of big science. Got it. I actually remember this. Yeah, I I, I think yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Not, not not everybody can have access to like the the supercomputer and just like do whatever they want. So like I remember uh, like uh, Thomas Wolf, the, the 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 founder of the of Hugging Face. I think he was one of the people who who had direct access or something. But anyhow, that that was more like I I hope people found this useful because I, I know I did. Um, and I, I think you can now kick it off the the the, the rest of the of the talk. Thanks for this. Yeah, of course. Um... Yeah, so I'm just gonna go through some of like the work we've done, um, uh, myself and my collaborators, and also talk about yeah some of like the unifying themes here. So um, yeah, one of the main works I'm gonna talk about is Pythia, which is um, just very high level. It's a set of language models that we released at Eleuther AI, ranging from 70 million to 12 billion parameters, which is you know somewhat somewhat small compared to say um, uh, the 70 billion Llama 2 model, of course, um, and is also, they weren't as capable as a Mistral 7B, uh, but we released these models at the end of 2022 and put out a paper and sort of the final version in April 2023. Um, and this was, yeah, this was at a time, even though it wasn't very long ago, the state of the LLM ecosystem and the state of the field in general was very, very different at the time, which is interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, so, um, we uh, designed Pythia not just as sort of any other new language model release, but we wanted these to be sort of uh, special made for like research and better understanding of language models. And so there were a couple things that we prioritized over, say, like the strongest downstream performance um, when training these just to make them more useful for this specific purpose, since there were various other releases like um, OPT, um, et cetera, that had already come out. Um, so the first is that we wanted all of the training data to be accessible and um, like readable so that any anyone could sort of know what, what what data the models were trained on and use that to make inferences about the performance and what led to these models performance. Um, and we also specifically wanted to let people sort of see what data the model had seen at each step of training. Uh, so we released not only the data set, which was the pile, but also the specific ordering and the data loader that we used. Um, and we also made sure that all of these models that we trained, like these eight different sizes of model, um, all had seen the same data exactly in the same order. And so this allows for sort of more controlled experiments than were previously possible on language models. Um, because previously you had things like the OPT suite, which were great for research, but at the same time, there are various sort of inconsistencies due to training, like um, the 350 million model doesn't have a layer norm, I think even. Um, uh, yeah, and we wanted to also make sure that the training was reproducible. So if you do have the compute, you can go sort of replicate um, our training of these models. Um, and if you have uh, less compute, then you can replicate sort of a subsection of training of the smaller model, perhaps. Um, and one of them to yeah, just be like this controlled test bed for um, doing uh, scientific experiments uh, and actually sort of narrowing things down. So you know that it's not just sort of arbitrary differences between these different models over sizes, but it's maybe uh, one specific component, like a larger um, parameter count. Uh, so yeah, so we envisioned this really as like a platform for future research. So it wasn't just sort of a one and done release, but it was something that once we put it out, it would make it easier for sort of subsequent works to build on it and uh, do the sorts of things that we were excited about studying. Um, and so we wanted Pythia uh, to be sort of reasonably representative of um, language models that were trained uh, at the time. Uh, and one problem with uh, studying language models, like for example, when you're trying to implement a new architecture and you find that at the 100 million parameter scale, maybe you get a 10% better score on some benchmark. Uh, it's difficult to assume that this is going to carry over when you scale up 10 or 100 times because uh, things might either like um, fail to work at scale or maybe just the regular um, vanilla architecture will sort of start to outcompete your uh, specialized tweak um, once you scale up further and use more compute. Um, and so we at minimum wanted to make sure that people could sort of study things at a variety of different scales uh, to the extent that we were, we had the compute uh, available to us. 
And so we, we released these models also with the vision of having them be used for sort of scaling law analyses and, and investigating how things change as you go from, say, 100 million parameters to tens of billions of parameters. And then we also used just basically an architecture that was nothing fancy, but sort of uh, the best practices uh, that we knew. So sort of vanilla architecture, flash attention, but with um, rotary positional embeddings and uh, parallel attention and feedforward layers. Uh, yeah, but so, so why did we go to all this trouble to train these models when they're not all that different from OPT, maybe you might ask. And so this is a resource and the specific thing that this is meant to be a resource for is for studying the effect of this um, training data component on language models. And so we didn't just release this artifact, but we also wanted to show basically what, uh, what one can study um, if you have access to these models. And so in the paper, we went into three different case studies, um, trying to sort of cover a wide range of subfields that we thought might be interested in the models and demonstrate how Pythia can let you take existing analyses further because of the, the extra information that you have that isn't available for like closed models or models put out by big companies. Uh, and so one of the case studies we did was extending some prior work on memorization. I'll, I'll discuss memorization a bit later. Um, extending it across the time axis. So looking at how this uh, memorization component of models changes as you continue to train them. How does it uh, differ when you have a model that's 50% of the way done versus all the way finished? Um, so not just looking at the model as sort of a static thing that exists, but um, yeah. Uh, and then the other thing we did is we sort of uh, showed how you can do sort of more involved uh, in experiments trying to investigate the role of the training data. That's only possible because you have the access that Pythia enables. And then we also uh, extended some prior work on looking at the training data to consider both the um, model scale or parameter count axes and the amount of training time axis. Um, and so this, these were sort of like a case in point of what you could use Pythia for. Uh, yeah, and so here I'll go into not just what we use Pythia for, um, but also what some other people in the community have used them for, because uh, we've seen in sort of the uh, the year that the Pythia models have been out in some form, we've seen a lot of adoption, which we're really excited about, and a lot of use of them to sort of do research that could not have otherwise been done. Uh, and so, yeah, so this gets to some of the things that we did in the Pythia paper, just trying to show what um, access to the training data on a fine grained level enables. So we wanted to answer the question, how does the training data affect these language models? Um, and that's, that's a pretty broad question, so useful to sort of scope that a bit. But um, one of the things that we're interested in is say, like, how does, um, how does the contents of the data affect downstream performance um, in sort of a simple way? And so we looked at um, extending some prior work, which takes a look at the GPTJ model and the pile and investigates how the amount of times that say, like um, the number 15 appears in the same document as 20, uh, how that correlates with um, how well the model is able to add those two numbers together accurately. And the, that paper, um, this previous paper by Rezegi et al found that basically, if you see these two numbers um, together in the same document more often in your training data, that vastly increases the chances that your model can actually add them together um, uh, correctly. And so we extended this not only across the scale and time axes with um, uh, addition and multiplication, but we also investigated um, how this impacts, say, like question answering performance. So this plot here is of uh, trivia QA performance, which is sort of a simple knowledge-based uh, question answering data set. Um, and it looks at a couple different I realize people can't see my pointer, um, but it looks at a couple different um, model sizes. So here it's um, 160 million, 1 billion, 2.8 billion, and 12 billion model parameters. Um, and then we looked at these different colors on each of these subplots are varying amounts of training time, where 143,000, or the brown line, is the end of model training. And then sort of from, from left to right in each of these subplots, um, 10 to the zero means that you've only seen these two entities that are in the question um, appear together one time in the training data. And 10 to the 6 means you've seen the two entities that the question is asking to relate um, over 10,000 times in the training data set. And as might not be too surprising, you do see that with the, at least with the 12 billion model, which is actually capable of answering these questions, uh, when something occurs uh, frequently in the training data as a fact, uh, it is likely to be uh, re recalled correctly. 
And when it's not frequent in the training data, it's not likely to be recalled correctly, although the models do get better, even for things they've only seen like 10 or one time. Um, yes, and so this allowed us to basically go further with existing work and try and do things, um, even though we're working with sort of a very large data corpus, um, trying to actually investigate things on a fine grade level. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. Just a quick question here. Trivia QA, it's that's basically testing the, the, the knowledge of the model, right? It's it's not, it doesn't have anything, or is it partially also like arithmetic type of types of questions, mathematics, or or just like more general, I guess, trivia? No, yeah, this is um this is trivia. So it's just like, oh, what, what city is the Colosseum in, in or something? Got it. So, and then the answer is Rome. Uh -huh. Yeah, but so, but so I guess the thing is here that this is only a correlational analysis. This shows basically, okay, we've got this model. It looks like it performs better when we have this condition, but we don't know if the fact that these uh, data points appeared more frequently is the cause of this happening or not. And so if you want to actually understand sort of like uh, the, a, a causal relationship and like if, if I change something about how I train my model, uh, how, would, how would this impact the behavior? Uh, you need to be able to do these changes and actually sort of find out what would have happened in the other situation. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah, so, so another thing that we did, and this is sort of one of the novel experiments that could only be done with Pythia, is we investigated what happens when you take the model that's, say, 90% of the way through training, and then you swap out the data set in a specific way and then get a new model out at the end of training and compare it to the original one. Um, at 100% a, a of training that wasn't tweaked at all. And so here, these um, lines of the same color are the sort of um, unchanged and changed models where we took uh, the model that was almost done training and then we swapped out the data set. Here, the data set is the exact same batches, the exact same tokens that the model would have seen otherwise, except every male pronoun in the data set is swapped out for a female pronoun. Um, and so we investigated on this data set uh, called Wino Gender which basically looks at like, yeah, how, how likely does the model um, assign um, male or female pronouns to um, some given occupation, like say a doctor. And we ask basically, does, does this actually change the behavior of the model on this bias task? And um, yeah, so since this was sort of the uh, simplest like transformation that we could make where we only swap out like one word at a time and still retain otherwise um, the um, exact training data. And um, we found that when you look, when you have a model that's large enough, and you do swap out uh, these pronouns, um, even on the last 10% of training, the behavior of the model does actually change. And so this green dotted line going down to about 50% means that basically it, it sort of ablated the bias of the model to answer with more male pronouns, since male pronouns appear more in the data set. And so the reason this is interesting and potentially extensible is because it shows that sort of the, the, the thing that we'd like to get to is how can we design a model and design our training data set for the properties of a model that we want. Um, so the point of Pythia is that um, not only can you look at the training data, but also uh, let's not just think about these models as static artifacts, but actually think about them as something that uh, had a bunch of decisions made by the model trainer go into it. Um, and that affects how the model is going to behave downstream. And so how can we make better decisions to get the sort of qualities that we want? And that's what we want to move toward. Uh, yeah. Quick question here, like why, why is the accuracy so low in the first place for the models? Like I see, what's that, 54? And then after the intervention, the big one, the 7B one goes around, I guess that's 50% or whatnot. Yeah, so this is a task where so accuracy is sort of, um, uh, Sort of, sort of the wrong name for this metric. It's like checking like on each of these cases which pronoun um, has a higher log likelihood. And so like higher accuracy, like accuracy of 100 would mean that in every single case in the data set, the model assigns um, a male pronoun with higher log likelihood. Um, so 50% means basically like performing at random or about equal. Um, Whereas these other ones being uh, above 50% um, and staying that way means that like uh, they assign more likelihood to male pronouns more often. Uh -huh. Got it, got it. So then I'm uh, confused because if you if you swapped out all, you said all or all like male pronouns or whatnot, then I would expect the model to just output female constantly and then be like at zero or hundred, whatever, the, if you know what I mean. Like I'm, I'm confused why it's, why it's 50 when you swap out the, when you do that type of intervention. Yeah, so so it could be the case that if we sort of 
or I guess if we did this intervention at the very beginning of training, then that would almost definitely be the case because you're just not seeing those other words um, ever. But um, in this case, you've trained your model like it's like 85% or 90% of the way through training, and then it's only sort of unlearning or changing the representations for a little bit. So that's why like it, it, it could be the case that if you train for longer, the 6.9b like forgets all of its previous knowledge. Um, no, it makes sense. So you basically you basically debiased the model in a way by forcing it to be more wherever the bias was, you're kind of pushing the other side over the last 10% of the data and you managed to get to around 50%, which is, I guess, ideal number. Yeah, I mean, I should clarify that like this, um, this bias benchmark is like not necessarily either like one, the thing we care about when talking about like societal implications or two, it's somewhat of like a noisy metric as well. Um, uh, so yeah, like I, I wouldn't say that this is sort of like a like proven and ready to go uh, like debiasing method, but it's sort of a demonstration that when you do change the training data, it does affect the model's behavior and it affects it in the way that you would expect. And I think I see that there's a question in the comments about like why these smaller models stay constant and don't really change their performance. I, I don't have a definite answer for that. I think one uh, reason could be that these models are just like not very good at the task and like any sort of like measurement here is really just noise and isn't actually like measuring a thing we care about or isn't that real. Um, and then another reason could just be that these models are like, uh, these small models are very, very overtrained in terms of like chinchilla optimal ratios. Like um, the 70 million parameter model is still trained for 300 billion tokens. And so even on like tasks like Lombada, which are just sort of like language modeling performance, um, they start to sort of go down slightly. So it might be that this sort of 70 million model is very saturated. L lost um, all of the neuroplasticity, I guess. <laughs> okay, I think Shan has a, uh, Shan, go ahead, you can ask the question. Hi, um, so how is the intervention done? I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it. Yeah, yeah, sure. So this was basically in an effort to like, um, uh, keep as many variables the same as possible. This is basically all that happened is we took the training data in each batch, detokenize it, swap out, like do a regex and swap out um, he to she, uh, et cetera, for different like, cases. And then um, uh, just uh, rerun training. So almost unaffected except for like switching out these few words. Because otherwise, if we had just sort of swapped for like a data set in a different language, we couldn't really keep like the underlying content or the semantics the same, mostly. So. Yeah, the goal here was basically to like control for things, so we're not just like, yeah, be picking up other noise in these measurements. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to dwell too much here, but like it is a surprising result because I would expect maybe the smaller models to go somewhat small, like slower with a smaller gradient towards fifty percent, but like they they are completely pretty much at the same baseline as as prior to the in intervention. So maybe yeah, I don't know. I, I would think it's a bug, but like obviously interesting interesting outcome. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. So um, yeah, so so those were sort of two of the things that we did in the Pythia um, paper. But then one of the other things that we did, which was concurrent to uh, the Pythia uh, suite um, paper, was um, work that we did um, on our team at Eleuther AI um, using these models, um, trying to in investigate memorization in language models, which if people aren't familiar with what memorization is, um, this basically refers to the fact that sometimes um, you can sort of extract the exact document that you fed to a language model during training when you prompt it in a certain way in inference. So if you give it, say, the first 16 tokens of something it saw during training, it might output the next 16 tokens verbatim. And this is, this is pretty bad from a privacy perspective if you have something like um, personally identifiable information from someone who's not, say, a public figure in your training data, and the model is just able to like regurgitate this verbatim when someone asks for it the right way. This is not good from a privacy perspective. Very good uh, literature on memorization of language models, but most of it is sort of aggregate, um, just basically like, okay, this language model, you can extract 2% of its training data from it, or this larger one, you can extract 5% of its training data from it, verbatim. Uh, and so in this paper, we argued basically like, um, it doesn't matter too much whether you memorize 1% or 2% of your pre-training data set, what matters is which specific data points you memorize, because if you memorize ones that have this personal information in them, then that's very bad for privacy. But if you memorize things that have, say, like a fact, like the Eiffel Tower is in Paris, um, then uh, 
that that's totally fine because you might even want your model to know that fact. And so that that's great. Like that's no problem. And so um, we wanted to sort of make sure that um, this distinction gets captured and also try wanted to find something that really excited me about this work is we're trying to find a way to sort of merge this theory and existing work pointing out that memorization is a problem with basically how can someone training a language model make better decisions in order to like mitigate this risk or get the behavior that they want out of their model. And so we wanted to try and propose uh, methods that um, uh, allow people to sort of know ahead of time what's the likelihood that some bad data points that I don't want to be memorized are going to get memorized and how how comfortable am I uh, sort of taking a risk on this and how can I sort of avoid doing this if I'm if it turns out that my final model will memorize these data points um, how can I avoid like spending the money to train that if I then maybe can't deploy it for safety and so the sort of uh, yeah I guess uh, there's not enough time to go into it in full but the thing that we ended up with is looking at the um, the recall of if you train a small language model like say the 70 million Pythia model and then you uh, run that uh, run inference on that 70 million model and you find out which data points that 70 million model memorized um, if you use that as sort of a marker of yes or no did that model did did the model memorize the final data point and you use that to, as a classifier for is my 12 billion model going to memorize this data point or not um, just based on whether the 70 million model did or not um, then the question is basically like how often are you correct and more importantly how often are you wrong where you find that your 70 million model doesn't memorize a data point but then you go and train your 12 billion with the same settings and you end up with a bunch of data points that you really thought were bad to memorize and you thought weren't going to be memorized memorized and so the way to sort of minimize these dangerous um false negatives is recall or false positives um but uh recall so basically um yeah, how many data points that the 12 billion is going to memorize did you miss um, and try to minimize that amount. And so we plotted this for sort of using varying uh, small Pythia models um, to try and show like um, which of these um, which of these small Pythia models gives the best trade off between how good of a predictor it is based on based on its recall versus how much compute did you spend to train this small model because the, the scenario we're considering is basically like you have some extra compute, you're going to train a small model to make sure that you're good to go on training your big one that's more expensive. Um, and if the small model turns out okay, and it says that none of the data points you don't want memorized aren't memorized, uh, then you train your big model. And so it's really expensive if you go to train your big model and you find out that you were wrong. Uh, and so we plotted this of compute versus the recall that you achieve. And there's some very weird stratifications here that sort of make it not quite a clean scaling law. Like, yes, the more compute you spend on this uh, prediction task, uh, the better you get. And of course, if you just go and train your big model and use 100% of the compute you would have, you get a perfect predictor. But that's not useful because you've not saved any money. Um, but there's sort of this interesting thing where if you're looking at spending less than 1% of your final compute budget, this first vertical dotted line, um, you you want to train um, a model of a specific size, um, uh, but then if you if you want to look at your um, uh, sort of you want to train uh, the largest model you can um, uh, when you're using 10% uh, of your compute budget, you want to train the largest model you can for um, as few tokens as it might be to fall under your compute budget for this prediction task. Uh, yeah, and so then, so basically, like this is sort of a, a thing that we hope people will sort of look at more and make it more robust, and also sort of have this be more of a consideration when people are training these models, both for sort of the privacy uh, option and also actually like intentionally designing your models and going out of the way to make choices when training that might, um, you know, affect performance but help in the things you care about, like say privacy. It is a super interesting plot, and I, I had a question or, or more of a comment, like. It mm -hmm. seems to me that this is implicitly assuming that the memorization across relevant words or whatever you're trying to, to capture is going to be uniform, which is likely not the case in the, because let's start with the imperfect filtering heuristics, like some of the concepts or sentences will probably repeat more versus less. So how, how do you kind of try and get that fine grained insight because yeah. Yeah, so there's some other work from another team at Eleuthera AI that should be coming out soon that is actually looking at like what is the content of the data points that get memorized, like what do they look like? 
um, and trying to understand that to so see if we can get any better handle on it. Um, but yeah, th this this currently does assume that basically like you, yeah, I guess first that you aren't going to be able to filter out everything that you don't want your model to memorize, which I can talk more about if you want, but I think is like a realistic assumption. And then because of like this imperfect filtering for PII or because like, yeah, there, there are various things you don't want a model to memorize, including like, I don't know, um, licensed text. Um, Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, th I think we can continue just to get that to get yeah, through all the slides and then we can go back. Yeah, so so another thing, and this was work that was not done by Luther AI, but I'm very excited about, um, is this work on um, sort of similar to the memorization angle, but this time looking at um, uh, the problem of basically uh, say that you have some language model weights and say that like the person who trained the model claims that they trained on this data set in this order. How can you how can you be confident that they aren't lying to you in some way that they didn't like leave out 5% of the data points or they didn't train on an entirely different data set. So how can you sort of verify that the way a model was trained is the way that it was actually claimed to be trained um, and verify the computation done. And so this paper sort of proposes a bunch of different heuristics in a procedure to uh, actually try and like sort of disprove when people are claiming that they trained on an entirely different data set than they um, actually did train on and also detect things like say removing 10% of the data points um, and um, uh, pretending that you didn't. Um, yeah and so there's definitely like a ways to go here but I think that this sort of basic problem that's trying to be solved and that's investigated is very very interesting because it might be useful for things like when you release an open source model or when you put it on hugging face how how do you confirm that this is actually the the true base Pythia model and that it's not one that somebody took and uh, put a backdoor in or something? Um, uh, yeah, especially with all these sort of adversarial attacks, um, it's useful to be able to sort of prove that this is the pre-trained model that you um, are distributing um, beyond just sort of providing the um, reference checksum or something. Maybe yeah. a quick question on my side here. Like, so what, what's the kind of the, the high level takeaway from 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 the paper? Like. How, how easy it is to 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 verify these types of questions? Uh, it, I, so one takeaway is that it depends on how much compute you have available to do the verification, because if you had enough, then you could just redo the training on the same data set and see if you get the same thing or about the same model. But but that's, that's too tough um, or too expensive. Um, so yeah, I guess that's one trade-off. And then the other thing is that this this sort of currently proposed procedure definitely works for sort of like egregious cases of like half the data that's supposedly trained on in this segment of training um, was missing or is like replaced with something else. That can definitely be detected, but sort of there aren't like provable guarantees on this. So it's more subtle things would probably work to get around this. Hmm. My, my fear here is that this is ultimately going to be like probably impossible in the sense that there was this very interesting line of work where people show how you can implement memories into LLMs. And like, mm -hmm. it's not unimaginable to think that you could implement something that's like a malware inside of the weights, literally. So like something triggers the model to output something and the attacker can use that. And and that, so so like, I, I don't see how you could check for that type of computation implantation, if I'm even expressing myself correctly, if you know what I mean. Um, but like, you can maybe some of those coarse grain types of changes, you can detect them. But like, if you just literally implant some memories or some instructions, it seems like an ill-poised problem, like similar to deep fakes. Like ultimately we'll just end up to having completely undistinguishable images and there is no way you're gonna notice just like observing the pixels that something has been changed. Indeed, theoretically, it's not impossible to get there, right? Even though we're we're not there yet. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, I think that this, yeah, this doesn't like try to uh, stop like data set poisoning attacks. Um, that's sort of another thing that's out there, but that people haven't really come up with defenses to yet, other than like, I don't know, just use data you trust. Um, but what, what is that data? Um, and yeah, I guess the other thing is like, yeah, yeah, my, my thought with the um, like uh, preventing backdoors is more like, I know I didn't implant a backdoor, maybe there was a data poisoning attack, but like I didn't intentionally implant a backdoor. And so I'm releasing this model and here's the proof that this is actually the base model. And then like if other people distribute the model, like it's not going to be the same weights. So that's sort of at least mm. a check that like, yeah, these sense. are actually the weights that are being distributed. 
I, I didn't even like I didn't even refer that much to to data poisoning in the sense of like manipulating mm -hmm. or implanting something to a training data set. I was I was thinking about like, having like, an actual training checkpoint and then tweaking it just a bit. Like of course you can do the hash and like see that there is something that's changed. Maybe th that's an obvious way to to do it. But uh, okay, this is super interesting. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, and then I guess other work has done things like use Pythia to investigate scaling laws. This is just like one figure from a paper that takes the Pythia intermediate checkpoints and looks at like their different scores on various tasks and finds that there's like an inverse scaling law where uh, instead of as the model getting bigger, the model gets worse on a task, but instead it's as you train a model for longer at any size, it gets worse on this task. And in this case, it's truthful QA. So this was a pretty cool uh, paper using Pythia. Um, um, and uh, Pythia is also... Oh. <laughs> just one more question there. Like I'm, I'm just, I, I have to think about whether this is a function of shuffling potentially, because like what's my mental model when I see something like this, I'm like, Maybe in the first phase of the training, for some reason, you, you have all of those concepts you're trying to learn. And then because you're unlucky in the second part, like you're simply not seeing those and you have catastrophic forgetting or something. Similar things that we see when we do it, like language adaptation for LMs or whatnot. But I, I, I'm fairly sure these guys like kind of tested for, for that type of, of thing. Um, yeah, I, I think that the odds of, oh, I will send the link to the inverse scaling loss paper later. Um, uh, I don't have it on hand, unfortunately. But um, uh, yeah, if you if you want to remind me at the end of the talk, so I don't forget, thank you. Um, I am I, I'm pretty sure that the like shuffling point is probably unlikely because so one problem when like trying to investigate how um, how like uh, how, how much the data uh, in like particular documents affect training is that like just the sheer size of the data set in terms of tokens is tough to deal with. Like um. Each batch is 2 million tokens for Pythia, and there is a lot of content in 2 million tokens. Um, and so like, the data is pretty well shuffled to the point where like, it's difficult to pick out a batch and say, oh, wow, this has more of the entity I care about in it. Maybe this is the thing that caused like, performance to go up in this training interval. Like, it's very difficult to do that, because there's going to be like, copies of that entity in every training batch almost. Interesting. So what, what do you think is the underlying explanation for, for like, such behavior? We're usually used to seeing just lot, like the curves going up with, with the scale. And then this was kind of a weird phenomenon. Yeah, um, I'm not 100% sure. I think for the smaller models, I think there could sort of be this issue where um, like the 70 million model, for example, is, is definitely sort of at capacity. Maybe that's in part due to like the learning rate schedule, but um, sort of like petering out at the end of training. But uh, so it could be that sort of like these models are losing plasticity or something along those lines um, and like not taking in any new info or sort of overfitting. Um, yeah, other than that, I, I'm not really certain why why this phenomenon happens. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, and then another thing that we both wanted Pythia to be used for and uh, excitingly it has. Um, is a bunch of papers. I think they're in the um, they're they're in the speaker notes of this slide um, for after the talk. Um, these papers, the figures are from uh, a bunch of them. Look at Pythia to try and understand like how model internals work, and also look at like how these change over um, uh, increasing model scale and um, uh, like increasing amounts of training time. Uh, yeah, and, and so yeah, so that's like a bunch of the stuff that people have used Pythia for, including what we at Eleuther have used Pythia for. But now I'm going to talk about sort of like uh, a somewhat overarching motif in a bunch of the research projects I've been involved in uh, that I'm vaguely calling research infrastructure. I don't think this is an existing term. Um, and so by research infrastructure, I don't just mean like the software and hardware stack that you use for, say, training a model, although that is very important and can enable a lot more sort of research or experimentation. Uh, I mean, by this, I sort of mean that like research projects similar to Pythia that allow uh, more of the work that you want to exist to be done. And so this might take the form of, say, like an artifact release that makes it much easier and lowers the barrier, barrier of entry to studying the sorts of things that you're interested in. Like in the case of Pythia, where we um, released these models both so that we could investigate models uh, impacts or the impact of training data on these models and also, um, uh, but also so that other people could also do this. And so that we could sort of pose it as something that is both possible and um, uh, interesting to study. Um, and the beauty of this public release and releasing something like research infrastructure is that 
um, having the whole uh, open source community with access to these uh, models or access to this idea or code base um, is a force multiplier, like a huge one. Just more people working on things, trying to figure out a solution um, is vastly uh, useful and uh, really helps for like making progress or coming at things from a different perspective or maybe introducing like interdisciplinary ideas that you wouldn't have because you don't have the that specific skill set, but someone else does and it appeals to them. Um, yeah, and so sort of this idea of just like laying groundwork for the things that you want to happen and the, the things you want the community to rally around as being very important. Um, uh, and yeah, an important part of this is, of course, making your work legible and reproducible. Um, it, it's important to make it easy for people to build on your work, which I certainly hope that we've done with Pythia um, so that it's actually sort of yeah feasible for them to um, understand and uh, uh, improve on and continue what we've worked on. Um, yeah, and of course, like this, this sort of thing can come in many forms. It could come in the form of releasing a model, to release a code base, to release sort of a method um, in the open, um, or it might be something like um, designing a benchmark um, that can track progress towards some shared goal as a subcommunity, and cementing sort of a research problem as worthy of study. Um, yeah, and so a bunch of the other projects that I've happened to work on have sort of fall, fallen into this category of doing the work to try to allow more people to leverage it later on down the line and have this be like infrastructure for further advances. So one thing that we recently put out as a collaboration between Eleuther AI and a bunch of different academics was um, this uh, work called Lemma, an open language model for mathematics. And so just for background, if people aren't familiar, Minerva is a model based on Google's Palm language model that was just taking the palm language models of varying sizes up to 500 billion parameters, which is quite large, of course, um, and fine tuning them just on a bunch of like math domain or math related data from the web and from uh, various other sources. And it turned out that doing this and training on specialized data was enough to get very, very strong performance on hard mathematics tasks like the MATH data set. Uh, however, even though Minerva was sort of a huge advance for the math and AI fields um, and very impressive and showed what language models could do, especially with the proper data and the proper compute, uh, Minerva was never released open source, either code to use it um, or code to run its evaluations or um, yeah, access to the model. Um, nobody except for the people who work at Google DeepMind on the same teams that built Minerva and those who collaborated with them through like internship, internships or other eyes uh, can use the model. And so, what this means is that even though it was sort of an advance for the fields, the rest of the community doesn't have access to a strong language model to experiment with. And so a lot of the ideas that could be built on Minerva haven't been yet. Uh, and so in order to try and like uh, improve progress and also, again, have tools available to ourselves to sort of further um, uh, the state of public knowledge and just general knowledge in the fields, we trained uh, off the base of Code Llama, um, which is based on Llama 2, uh, we collected a large data set and trained them specifically, uh, fine tuned these models specifically for math. Um, and so, um, yeah, and, and so not only did we release these models in their own hugging face, but also we wanted to try and have this be in general a strong foundation for further research in the field. And so not only did we also release the data set, which is a combination of open web math, um, which is a data set that our uh, collaborators built um, out of um, basically scraping the web for mathematical text and then filtering it down heavily, um, as well as a filtered version of the stack code data set and archive. Um, but we also released things like um, uh, the code to generate the data set, as well as uh, tools to check the models for exact match contamination. Again, this is, these two figures are um, uh, test, test set contamination for the MATH and um, GSMAK mathematics data sets. Uh, and so we did find hits in our um, data sets, both in the web data and the code data for the sort of problem descriptions and in some cases the solutions of these problems. Um, but interestingly, um, when we compared on a stratified level between the accuracy of the model on things that it had seen before uh, in some form um, and uh, problems that it hadn't seen, at least in exact match contamination, uh, there was not a significant difference in performance, uh, which I think is very interesting. And more recent work maybe suggests that this is because there are more forms of contamination than just sort of exact um, string matching. 
um, or n-gram matching. Uh, but yeah, I think that this is something that would be very exciting for people to build on in the future, and I hope that they do study contamination in more detail. But again, it's something that can't be done unless you have access to the full training set. For example, um, we don't have access to the training data for LAMA2, so we can't do this sort of contamination analysis on it. Uh, and yeah, so another component of the paper that we also wanted to try and make uh, an easy to build on base was our evaluation setups. So we evaluated on sort of a suite of different mathematics tasks. Uh, some of them where possible were matching the setup from Minerva and matching their prompts when they gave them, although they did not always give uh, their few shot prompts, and so it wasn't always possible to replicate the Minerva setting. Uh, but yeah, we, we compared to Minerva, and although it is important to note that the um, models that we fine-tuned on were trained for more tokens than the Palm models, we still do end up um, beating out Minerva when you uh, control for a number of parameters in the model, um, which we're quite excited about. And at the end of the day, although this isn't a compute equivalent uh, comparison, it does mean that these models are useful enough for further study of using them downstream. Uh, and we also evaluated on um, uh, using the models with a Python interpreter augmented, um, so both on GSMAK and MITH. Um, and then also we evaluated on formal mathematics, which if you're interested, feel free to go read the paper, um, but I won't discuss because of time. Uh, yeah, and so then I guess evaluation and the difficulty of evaluation brings me to one of the other things that I've uh, recently been one of the developers on um, updating and maintaining, um, the LM evaluation harness. So this is a library that was created by Luther AI a long time ago, around the release of GPT-3 actually. Um, that um, well before my time um, to try and sort of uh, run few shot evaluation um, on various tasks you know, supported by GPT or evaluated by on by GPT three and to evaluate a Luther's um, language models like GPT Neo. Um, so this uh, code base was not only just there to be able to make running evaluations easier, but also um, there to sort of try and standardize and improve the best practices in evaluation. Uh, doing uh, evaluation of language models properly and in a controlled way is very annoying and can could consist of things like tracking down the original code base for every benchmark data set that you want to test on, hoping that it was created uh, after the fact of um, causal language models existing so that there's a, like sort of an official prompting setup, um, and then evaluating your model on that paper's code base. Um, and if people don't control for things like the uh, prompts um, that they use or the way that they score um, outputs from the model or extract answers, then it's very difficult to know whether something, when you compare two numbers between two papers, it's very difficult to know if they evaluated in at all the same way um, or if these comparisons are at all meaningful. And so we really recommend like not ever just pulling numbers straight from a paper, but instead making sure that you can evaluate it on your own code base uh, if the model is released. Uh, and so, yeah, LME Val Harness is sort of a tool that um, supports a bunch of different tasks in, in as close to the reference uh, original uh, author's implementation as possible to try and make evaluation a bit easier. Um, and yeah, we've been lucky to see um, uh, it have adoption from the community, including being used for Hugging Faces, OpenL, and leading, Leaderboard. Uh, and uh, yeah, Eleuther AI will be releasing a new uh, version of the harness at the end of this month. Uh, which includes a bunch of new features such as VLLM support and a few other libraries, as well as sort of an easier um, way of contributing new evaluation tasks and setups, plus uh, more configurable prompting tools and um, expanded documentation. And we want to continue development on this to try and have a sort of centralized place for evaluations um, for the community. This is yeah, awesome. I'm going to say all the nice things about the, the framework. I've been using it over the last days. Uh, I think Anin yeah, Deep has a question. I think I butchered your name, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, no problem on that. Um, so hi, Ali, and hi, everyone. Um, it's really awesome, by the way, and super great fan of LM Evaluation Harness. I have been using the Code Evaluation Harness by Big Code for quite a while now, and it's like super great. Um, the I have actually three questions. Uh, First question is like, I have been using the code evaluation harness for a quite a while right now. And I mean, I, I, I have been testing it to compare different language models. For example, the Lama 7B and different 7 billion parameter models. Uh, a pattern that I saw is was that the numbers that I saw in the papers are actually not matching with the one that I'm reproducing. However, 
the numbers that I'm getting in the uh, code LLM leaderboard is actually matching, which means that we have no discrepancies when I am like doing the reproduction of the results and the one that is already been reproduced by evaluation harness. But I am seeing the discrepancies in like the one that I'm reproducing and the one that has been noted in the paper now. There are reasons that the inference setting was different. Sorry and for interrupting. But, uh, just a quick yeah. remark. I think this is much better for a GitHub issue or, or offline on Discord because we have only a bit of time, and I think it's a bit more technical question uh, for it to be relevant to everybody else. So sorry for doing I this, see. but yeah. Uh, I'm sure. Sure, uh, I can just put this into a GitHub issue. Yeah, for sure. Or, or also on Discord later. Like I think Haley can can reply on on, on Discord. Yeah, it's going to be easier that. because it's it's a fairly complex question. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, happy to yeah. Yeah. Uh, for sure, for sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I feel like if if the time is less, then we can like discuss more on Discord if that that's the case. I guess yeah, that would be awesome. I think that's the best way. And Haley can can wrap up the the, the slides. Yeah, ah, so, okay. so that's that's all for me. Um, yeah, I hope that this was interesting and coherent. Um, yeah, happy to chat more about any parts. Awesome. Healy, this was super, super cool. Uh, talk. I really enjoyed it. And also the, the, the first part, we're just like learning a bit more about, about your story and, and all of the cool work you, you've done. Uh, if people have questions or they're not too technical of the sort of the previous one, feel free to shoot uh, else. Like, otherwise, we can reply those offline as well. Um, I saw some hands and then they all disappeared when I said this. <laughs> I guess I have one question that's more more high level and probably relevant to to everybody here. Like, what are you most excited about right now? What are you working on, or like, what, where do you see what do you see is, is the next as the next component that's gonna improve the systems um, to become even more powerful? Like, for example, GPT four. Like, what, what what would you do to make it better, or something like that? A bit open ended, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's um, yeah, that's sort of tricky to answer, and also tricky because of sort of the, the lack of publicity around certain details. Um, I think something that I'm very excited about that uh, Luther's been working on in collaboration with some others um, is trying to build a sort of new um, a new pre-training data set that is actually sort of fully permissive in its licensing. Um, I think that something. Yeah, I, I think sort of like so the major blocker to me, at least in studying and understanding language models better is having models that have their training data transparent and open because it's otherwise very difficult to like demystify how they work and why they work or actually like how well these models generalize at all. Um, and so, yeah, I'm very excited about work trying to sort of like release more models with uh, documented data and uh, fully public data. And mm -hmm. so, did we see like recently? I think was it Together AI or somebody released this huge like thirty trillion data set? Like I'm, I didn't, I didn't get into the licensing part, but like, what's your thought on that? If you saw it, yeah, I guess so. Like Common Crawl um, definitely requires filtering to like make sure to take care of licensing. It's sort of scraped from everywhere, and all of these pages might have varying different um, actual licenses on, on the page. Uh, so yeah, I think Together's release is really, really cool. And I hope that it'll give us a better understanding of like what constitutes high quality data and what data you should be looking for and how to filter things. But um, yeah, it, it would definitely require filtering for things like licensing. Makes sense. So so data is something I, I think it's obvious. Like the it's it's crazy. I've been repeating this over the last calls as well. Like it's crazy how simple from the research standpoint, like to get to the capability that we got to. It did boil down to having higher quality data, having more data, having better engineering infrastructure for building bigger models, and like more compute. And of course, there's been a ton of stuff that, like, that's I wouldn't say peripheral because it would diminish the value. But like to get to the extra, if you just care about the capability, it's crazy how simple the the the, the ingredients are. <laughs> so like you mentioning data is definitely a big 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 part of it. With also when we saw. The, the results of the chinchilla paper and and, uh, and and all of those insights it's very interesting um i think Han has a uh can race you can you can ask the question i'm just rambling <laughs> yeah uh recently there is a lot of talks from the orca papers and orca authors 
about synthetic data, and there's a lot of hype around um, generating synthetic data to make the model stronger in one way or the other. What are your thoughts about that? And the second question is, in terms of the pre-training data, how would you measure data quality in a uh, more scientific manner than just by the pre-training results at different checkpoints? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think, um, yeah, so I think synthetic, synthetic data is definitely a big deal and will like continue to be very important, especially for like the reason of just being able to control um, models output, like um, sort of this sort of aspect of RLHF or RLAIF, anything that's sort of about control or actually modifying a model to sort of output things in either the style or content or um, uh, the way that you want it to is going to be very important, especially, you know, just in terms of sort of refining them or making them usable downstream. Um, I think one thing to be concerned about with synthetic data is, of course, like um, uh, contamination, either like having contamination seep in through the model that you're using to generate synthetic data, or just sort of optimizing too hard for, like, like I guess with, with measuring data quality, you have to make sure that you're not just measuring like, okay, which data points give me, wh what subset of the data is going to give me the best score on this one single narrow benchmark, because you might optimize very hard for the benchmark, but that might not correlate to something that's actually good at things that don't look exactly like that or that generalize as well. And so um, I think data quality is still sort of this very nebulous thing. But one thing is that I think just um, like there, there's a lot of noise in like web scale pre-training corpora. And I think even just trying to improve how much we can clean that out is um, very notable. Like I think there was one post on Twitter from Luca Soldani showing that like there, there's a Reddit sub uh, subreddit where people just post like the letter M re repeated thousands of times. And this is in your pre-training corpus and your model is learning to memorize this or like base 64 strings. And mm. so if you could get better at filtering out the things you don't want it to learn, like you can probably trim your data size down quite a lot. And, and I think like as a part of the Bloom or OPT project, people did find that, that sequence of like 1 million, like like um, backslash symbols or something like that. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's... yeah. <laughs> okay, Amrit, go ahead. And I think this is the last one. We are already over time. Uh, sure. Sorry if I missed it, but uh, how if you are non-profit, how does the money come for compute uh, salaries and stuff? We did yeah, that so in, the be in the beginning, but Haley can quickly reply. Yeah. yeah, so we have a few sponsors who like uh, care about the research we're doing and uh, also apply for things like grants uh, for research. Uh, and then also we, um, yeah, just in general, we've been lucky enough to have like compute support from people like Stability AI um uh yeah via partnerships and um yeah basically um yeah getting compute grants that way um since we don't we don't have the funds to say buy our own um thousands of h100 cluster um yeah and we won't so, so add the employees like full-time salary or what's what's going on there yeah so so we do have a few we have like a small team working full-time um and those people do have salaries. <laughs> They're not volunteers. Awesome, Haley. This was this was super uh, super nice to, to to hear you cover all of these projects and and hear a bit more about your story. So, with that, I think we can stop the recording.